So thank you very much for attending this talk. I'll go ahead and move this at least to introduce myself. And actually, uh, Julie set things up nicely. I'll speak loudly for just a minute, is that okay? My name is Richitha Wilson. I am a child neurologist at UCLA, and uh, more specifically, a behavioral child neurologist. So a lot of my work focuses in on neurodevelopmental conditions, um, autism, for example, global developmental delay, and then I see a lot of individuals, children and adults, uh, with neurogenetic conditions. And actually, Julie, what you said set up, I think, this talk very nicely in the sense that I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, why research matters, but why also good clinical work also matters, and how those two come together. And I've been on the both sides. I've been one of those physicians who sees something abnormal and then says this is abnormal and I don't know what to do, but let's try to figure it out. And I've been one of those who says, you know, this is what we need to do. And a lot of those questions that came up and what I'm gonna to present to you today is because of the latter, where I didn't know what to do and I wanted to get better understanding of what we could do. Uh, so thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, I can go ahead and use this, maybe if that's easier. Whatever works for you. So just quickly, some disclosures. Uh, I do get funding from NIH, from the National Institute of Health, from the government, and then I do serve on a sports science committee for the United States uh, Tennis Association. So let's start out first why, why is motor function important? Well, motor abnormalities or differences or impairments or dysfunction, people have used various different terminology for that, are prevalent in many neurodevelopmental disorders or conditions and neurogenetic syndromes. And uh, oh, right here. I like to use my hands a lot, so I don't wanna. Um, and I'm gonna go through that a little bit today. And motor development is very intrinsically linked to the development of communication, cognition, social engagement. And when you see the diagram over here to the right on this, it's that as we can say, and many of you who I've met with today have seen the delayed sort of motor skill realm, but as soon as you begin achieving some of those motor milestones, right, walking, for example, crawling or moving in some wow. way, you're able to explore the environment a lot more, you're able to manipulate objects, and you're able to engage with other people. And that sort of naturally leads to this cascading effect where you have the ability to then develop some communicative gestures Lay, laying the ground for language, develop things like spatial perception and visual motor control. All very important things as you get bigger and try to build some of those fundamental motor skills. What's very important also from a research and clinical standpoint is motor function can be observed and measured over time, so it actually gives us an opportunity to detect whether there is something abnormal and whether or not we need to intervene. And it can also serve as a target for intervention. So most commonly, we see things like physical therapy and occupational therapy. And now thinking about what are maybe other motor therapies we can think about, including those across a lifespan, and that may not only improve motor function, but in turn, because of this cascade, other developmental areas as well. So let's first talk about the prevalence of motor abnormality. So this here to the right, you see the DSM. It's our sort of diagnostic manual. Many of you may have heard of it, where we make diagnoses of neurodevelopmental conditions in others. And you see some of the terminology taken from here. So in autism, for example, what's noted as associated deficits within the diagnosis are things such as, this is directly word for word in the DSM, odd gait, clumsiness, and other abnormal motor signs. So I'll get to this a little bit during my talk, but good, good for clinicians to recognize that. But what does other abnormal motor signs mean, right? Can we get a little bit more specific about that and understand it? In ADHD, it notes that motor delays often occur, and there's studies about motor delays occurring in fine motor before the diagnosis of ADHD. And in intellectual disability, they note that delayed motor language and social milestones may be identifiable in the first two years of life. They're also common in neurogenetic conditions. So motor delays in a study that we did here retrospectively asking many families through our genetics clinic, the care and research and neurogenetics clinic, we found that motor delays was one of the first earliest signs of concern is what led a family to go to a subspecialist or to their pediatrician and ultimately maybe even to a geneticist for a diagnosis or at least some evaluation. Data has also shown that motor delays might be associated with a higher likelihood of having a genetic condition or abnormality. So there was a study done in 2017, looked at a large database, and what they found was for every one month delay in walking, it put you at a 17% higher risk for having a de novo copy number variant, so a duplication or deletion in your chromosomal microarray genetic condition. 
So again, very prevalent, very important to be thinking about. And we know that hypotonia can, as many of you have seen, can really impact mobility and function. And more so even as we're thinking about these individuals coming through school age, coming through older, your ability to keep up with peers, your ability to keep up even an adaptive PE, and making sure that we're thinking about those things when we're adapting sports and therapies. Uh, so noted here, the table that you see on the right, Dr. Russell wrote with Dr. Graham that they note here, and I highlight, so in ASXL and all my reading that I had done and a couple of patients that I have, and I'll, I'll reflect on some things that I've seen in the, yesterday also, are often noted to have hypotonia, motor delays, joint contractures, all common things. And so a mixture we see of both hypertonia and hypotonia. And as I noted already, these features are important for early identification, for intervention, and also for clinical monitoring. So I added this, yesterday I had an opportunity and I see many familiar faces in the audience and thank you very much for taking the time to participate in the gait and movement study that we're doing. Um, I sincerely appreciate your time and also the opportunity for me to get to know more about ASXL conditions. And as a child neurologist and a motor person, uh, these are just some reflections I offer, and I kind of just made a comment before. They may lend to more questions than answers, but I think for me, at least in my realm, that's a good thing because then it makes me want to start answering some of those questions. But here are some of the things that I saw in my neurologic exams yesterday. Particularly in ASXL1, although I saw in both, a mixture of hypotonia and hypertonia. So that's interesting as a neurologist because Oftentimes, you might see some of those, meaning more axial hypotonia, truncal, and appendicular hypertonia spasticity. But it wasn't just that that I was seeing. I was seeing in some of the same kids sort of a mixture throughout the body of low tone and high tone. I was also seeing some kids who had very low tone with no evidence of spasticity. And some at a young age, five years of age, with quite a bit of spasticity. And I wonder why. That's interesting. That's not generally the case that we see. We might see spasticity in individuals who are low tone, hypotonic at a young age. We might see hypertonicity or spasticity at a later age just because of the natural flow of that. But we weren't seeing that. I was seeing it across the age. And I you know, mentioned to Dr. Russell, and I have some more looking to do myself, but in some literature search that I did last night, it's not particularly associated. It hasn't been studied but with evidence of differences in the brain. So that's what it makes you think. Are there structural abnormalities related to that? So what is it about the genetic change that's leading to these two different motor presentations? Um, hypotonia, also an AS, um, XL3. And so seeing this sort of subtle, more subtle hypotonia in these individuals that may not be as prominent, that maybe were picked up at an earlier age and are resolving but are still present. And thinking about how that can impact your speed, how that can impact your running, how you're keeping up with other peers, how you're engaging on the playground, and making sure we monitor that. I saw coordination difficulties, some very subtle coordination difficulties, particularly in Bainbridge, and very subtle overflow of the upper extremities and the fingers. And think about that when it comes to handwriting, when it comes to adaptive skills, like putting on your clothes, buttoning up. I saw very prominent and also very subtle differences in gait. And I wonder, these are all early reflections, okay? No evidence-based, not published yet, the things that I wanted to share with you all. Is there some hip abductor weakness that we're seeing? Is there a reason why we're seeing the hips move before the feet move? So these are all interesting things that I was able to start understanding yesterday. And I think along with some of our quantitative data, what I'll present to you over time we've done in other syndromes, that hopefully I can get a better understanding of, we can match along with some MRI data or others and start answering some of those questions as well. So this is kind of moving back just to provide some evidence on um, how motor development can impact other developmental domains. Because one of the goals of this talk was also to talk about how does motor affect the rest of the body. Can everyone hear me okay back there? Okay. I don't want to go too fast. I know we started a little bit later, but I do want to leave time for questions. So if I'm going too speedy, just let me know and I can slow down a little bit. But you could pull the mic up a little higher. A little I think bit. Would be helpful. Here we go. <laughs> I'll try to stay behind here. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I won't come over there as much as I can. But if I do and you can't hear me, just tell me to go back to the <laughs> um, It's hard. I like to be up with you guys. So we already talked about the fact that motor development is crucial in driving multiple cognitive processes. It can have this cascading impact on language, cognition, social communication. And I'll show you some diagrams now. But here's one study really showing that interrelationship between motor and cognitive and language development in children with and without intellectual and developmental disabilities. And they studied here about 
70 children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and what they found essentially was that there was quite a bit of correlation between the motor domain and the measurement that they used. It's called the Bailey, the language and the cognitive domain, and those that had lower motor scores had lower scores in these other areas. And so let's talk a little bit about maybe some of the work that's been done in those without intellectual and developmental disabilities that has laid the groundwork for what we know. Here in this study, these researchers looked at infants and toddlers from 10 to about 12, uh, excuse me, 13 and a half months of age. And what they did over this time is every two weeks, they gathered what their motor ability was and what their language ability was. And ultimately here you see two graphs. You see the motor on the x-axis, you see the receptive and productive vocabulary on the y, and you see those two graphs. And what they found was, as you went from crawling to walking, you saw an increase in receptive and expressive language. But when they went back and looked at the kids who were walking earlier and those who were moving more in general, regardless of age, what we call controlling for age, it's not just the older kids, those kids had more language and higher sorts of language. So that shows us that relationship of that motor ability, the gross motor, and how it relates to receptive and expressive language ability. And why, again, lending the importance of identifying those delays earlier and trying to intervene in some format to help other areas of development. This study right here, we'll kind of move through quickly to get some of the other data, was a study really showing what that interconnection looks like in the brain. So this is a brain-based study, not behavior, not looking at developmental milestones, where they essentially looked at connectivity between motor areas in the brain and between cognitive and motor areas of the brain. This study was done in infants and toddlers who are at an elevated likelihood for autism. So not yet, they ultimately may or may not have met that diagnosis, but then we developed, we call some maybe familial genetic risk for autism due to having a sibling with them. And what they found here with that brain network associated with cognition showed cross network connectivity, those brain regions are connected to areas of gross motor function. Particularly, they looked at onset of walking on a behavioral assessment. So now let's move over to how we measure motor function, and many of you saw this yesterday, and it lends into why we're doing some of the quantitative assessments. So we have caregiver questionnaires. Some of you may have filled out something called the Vineland. Uh, it is a measure that we use for adaptive function, for motor skills, and then we have motor measures. We have the neurological examination, which I had a chance to do with many families yesterday. We have standardized developmental assessments, and we have standardized motor assessments. And what I'll get to, what we're gonna address, is despite these sort of assessments that we have, we still have major gaps in our field of studying individuals with different neurogenetic conditions with a range of cognitive and behavioral abilities. So motor assessments that can be used in these sort of uh, groups that maybe aren't, and what I'll get to in a little sort of later as we move through the slides, that are able to actually quantify different motor differences across cognitive and behavioral function. And I'll explain that a little bit more. And also motor measures, despite the ones that I showed you, that are sensitive and specific and can yield more what we call objective data, not subjective, where I as a neurological examiner might say, this is increased tone in this area, so maybe another neurologist would uh, disagree on the level of what that might be, something more objective that isn't left for subjective interpretation. And better understand, particularly in neurogenetic conditions and neurodevelopmental conditions, how they drive other areas of development. And so we're addressing these gaps by using these sort of translational tools, we call it, to improve this characterization. And many of you saw it firsthand with the gate map that we used yesterday. So what I'm gonna go through now is another genetic syndrome in which we did some pretty extensive genotyping and some of the data that it led us to and the endpoints that we were at and what I hope to do across many other conditions as well. So this is duplication 15Q syndrome. It is a copy number variant, a duplication, say extra genetic material that's highly associated with autism. And what you can see down here at the bottom table is it's also highly associated with both motor delays and autism. And so we had a larger study ongoing at UCLA called the Brain and Behavior and Genetic Syndromes. I'm not gonna take the time, just for time here today, to go into depth about it, but it had other phenotyping that we call. Vineland, other direct observation questionnaires, and ADOS for an autism, and we had EEG as a part of it. But what we didn't have was a motor battery. And so during my fellowship, I took the opportunity to speak to some other uh, geneticists, neurologists, to see what they were using, and we chose to use something called a movement assessment battery for children. And I wanted to use it because it 
really elicited or looked at some major important neurologic domains, so things around manual dexterity, aiming and catching, and gait and balance. And so in theory, it's supposed to take about 20 to 30 minutes to complete. So I'm gonna show you some videos about what we saw here. This first one, both of these individuals are, one is five, one is almost six. So this is the gait and balance portion of the MEBC. The expectation is that this individual walks across the line taking a certain number of steps and walks across them both on the tiptoes and what we call in tandem, one foot in front of the other. So in looking that again, we see that maybe he didn't totally understand the direction, but really what we thought it is when I did the neuro exam is he has some low tone, making it a little bit harder for him to come up on his tiptoes and make it fully across there. Let me see our next individual. So here, she's about the same age. She makes it fully across. But I think what we can all tell here, neurologist or not, is that, I do it again. Her feet are pretty intern. You might see this in some of your kiddos or not, right? She's actually holding her left arm a little bit more rigid than her right arm. And she's moving across it like this, right? And so ultimately, both of these individuals scored the same on this motor assessment. They scored at the floor because neither of them could do all of the tasks that were requested. The first one couldn't get up on his tiptoes and she couldn't do it in tandem on there. So what did that yield us? Nothing. We just knew they both got a zero. What did I see as a neurologist? Hypotonia and hypertonia and very distinct reasons why they weren't making it across that. And so after doing these battery of tests, we went back and I said, okay, that's interesting. And we looked at all our scores across the individuals we had done with these two of you. And what we found was that actually 60% of the participants were able to complete a lot of the tasks like you saw, but many of them couldn't stay attentive, couldn't complete it in time, or couldn't comprehend all the different directions we were trying to give them. But when we qualitatively looked at it, we realized that all of them had quite a weak bridge of the pen, so their manual dexterity was weak. Almost none of the individuals could anticipate a catch, so that visual motor integration was really not fully developed. And all of them had some sort of aspect of abnormal gait or abnormal balance. And so we gleaned a lot more from that than we did from the actual standardized assessment while we were doing this study. And I won't spend as much time on here, but essentially led me to do a pretty deep dive of the literature. This was more specific around autism and intellectual disability, and just recognize that we were lacking those assessments across the board. So just because of some of the gait data that we did here, I'm going to skip a large function of two years or so of my fellowship and get down to the data so we can kind of review that today. But it's now using some of the quantitative measures and what we were able to derive from that and not derive from that. And also ongoing at the same time, we do have a preclinical study of this syndrome at UCLA, Dr. Pamon Golshani who's doing that and they were doing many of similar measures in that preclinical as well to think about translational tools from preclinical to clinical models. And so here, uh, similarly at a family meeting as well, we did phenotyping or motor on both siblings and individuals with duplication 15Q syndrome. This is on the gate mat that many of you saw yesterday and this morning. The gate mat has pressure sensors embedded within it. It's made up of three layers. And those pressure sensors allow us to derive what we call kinematic variables of gait. So things like speed, uh, the, the width of the gait, the length of the steps, oftentimes more subtle things we can't get on the neurologic exam. So just to walk you through this, this is the sibling. You can see, you can't see my person. Down at the bottom, you see the green line moving fully across. That's the center of mass. And you can see she's keeping a fairly good centered center of mass. Up here at the top, you see the right foot fall and the left foot fall. What it shows you in gait is you should be doing sort of double stance and single stance, double stance and single stance, heel to toe, heel to toe and she's doing that fully across there. And what that's showing you is on the top right-hand side is a cyclogram, that's sort of hourglass figure, and you see that <laughs> So let's look at her sibling, who has duplication 15 q syndrome. So right after, after I get out of the camera, right off the bat, you can see she's more wide-based there. I can even see that clinically, but it sort of continues. Her center of mass is not staying in the same way, so it's taking her a lot more to stabilize herself. It's something that I saw in a lot of the children and young adults that I uh, we did gave yesterday, an examination on yesterday. And what I noticed, which I didn't see on my neuro exam, is here on the right foot, when you see that heel to toe, she wasn't doing the same heel to toe distribution on the right side as she was on the left side. And so subsequently, we actually recommended to the family that maybe they talk to their neurologist about doing some imaging 
and seeing whether or not there is some brain differences or changes or talking about that if that worsens over time. And so let's put that into the context actually of the data and comparing it to other individuals. So here on the left side, you see the picture what we saw of the gate of the duplication 15Q participant and sorry, of the sibling without duplication 15Q and one with duplication 15Q. On this table in the first column, you see the speed of walking, the velocity, the length of the steps, and the width of the steps. And what you can see is that the sibling with duplication 15Q and autism is more than less than half the speed of those from the normative values, about half the speed of her sibling, the length of steps is much shorter, and the width of her gait is much shorter. Again, relating to the many things that we talked about in terms of being able to keep up, being able to fully balance herself, and likely the need for continued intervention to help her with those things. Things that we weren't, or cues we weren't able to pick up on otherwise. And again, for time, I skip it over here, but what interesting you're seeing is that it was very similar to the mouse model of the preclinical data in the literature that we have looked as well. So lending itself potentially to a translatable tool or feature we could see from the preclinical studies to the clinical. Again, I'm kind of stick, skip ahead, but essentially from all of this data, we, were, we published this paper where essentially we compared individuals with duplication 15Q to those with uh, autism without a genetic syndrome and a typically developing population without a genetic condition or neurodevelopmental condition. And we looked at three areas, pace, postural, control, and variability. And I put this line here to kind of get to the next slides, but what I wrote in the paper was the ultimate goal is to develop a quantitative motor that could serve as translational clinical endpoints for future treatment trials in this syndrome. And I'll just show you some of the data quickly of where we're at now in summarizing it. So this is the velocity. Normalized just means we normalize it per height, which is what we typically do because that can change velocity. And what you see here in these different box plots are comparison. The first one is duplication 15Q and TD is typically developing. The second one is duplication 15Q and those with autism without a neurogenetic condition. And the last is those with autism without a neurogenetic condition and typically developing. And what we can see is there's significant differences in individuals with duplication 15Q, both in those with typically developing. It is a little less uh, apparent or attenuates, we should say, when we compare those with autism without duplication 15Q, which is interesting in thinking about the overlap between those two conditions potentially and the overlap in neurobiology. And then we see again, though, continue to see differences in the last group without a genetic condition as well. But to summarize that, essentially what we saw was there was successful evaluation of those with autism with a wide range of behavioral and intellectual abilities that we were not able to do with the standardized motor assessment or find in our study. Some defining features of duplication 15Q were the greater variability in gait and much slower pace. There were features of poor postural control and variability in gait between both do 15Q and those with autism without a genetic syndrome, helping us maybe better understand that there could be common neurologic differences in both, uh, such as cerebellar abnormalities, which is a big area of our brain that controls movement. So what that sort of led to, and this is one component of a much larger studies being done, but now in Europe, a trial that has started, um, which is a multi-center randomized double blind, it's a placebo-controlled proof of mechanism trial in children with duplication of Q's and The actual sort of uh, decision from what we're getting in is an EEG and an EEG signature, and whether that shows any change, and if that's the case, then our clinical endpoints are predominantly adaptive function, which includes motor skills as well. So from our very large phenotyping study, using quantitative measures such as EEG and motor, we were able to get to a point where we have measures that we hopefully can actually follow and see whether or not there's change using an intervention or a potential drug target. Now that's not always the case in every you know, study that we see, but this was one area where we we're actually able to measure maybe more subtle and specific things that we can monitor over time compared to using a measure where you might not see any differences, right, between everyone meets sort of the floor score, and then what do you monitor for change over time? So that's the reasoning where we think about these qualitative and quantitative measures and how we can use them independently and together. I'll quickly just give an example here of another condition that we did motor phenotyping and behavioral phenotyping on, which is SCA21. And this lends to a little bit of what Julie was talking about, which is helping other clinicians know what to detect and know ultimately they need to genetic testing to send. We phenotype individuals with spinal cerebellar attacks at 21. We found that there was both motor difficulties and neurodevelopmental uh, diagnoses that were not described before. And in both of those, suggesting that in the brain, maybe there's a common
common role for spinal cerebellar pathways, contributing to both neurodevelopmental conditions like autism and intellectual disability and motor impairment. And we also found greater motor difficulties were associated with greater neurodevelopmental difficulties as well. And ultimately, after we published this paper, I received this email from a genetics fellow in North Carolina who said, we read your paper, uh, we saw a young girl, she saw some, she had both autism, that's why she presented initially, but she also had some of the motor movements you guys described. We chose to pursue testing, which we didn't do in the first couple of visits, and we found a similar genetic abnormality. So again, just the importance of clinicians like myself, who also look to these papers that other clinicians write to say, okay, I have a patient in my clinic, we see some abnormal things, I'm not really sure, let me search, do a PubMed search and see what else has come up. And if I see that, it's gonna lead me toward thinking about other things, so broadening my diagnostic uh, thinking. So that brings us back a little bit to the reflections that I have on some of the ASXL conditions. And I think as I go through these questions and as we process some of this quantitative data and we process, I kind of conglomerate all my neurologic exams, as I start better understanding whether this spasticity is more distal versus more proximal recall, whether those gait abnormalities affect speed or width of step, my hope is I can start better understanding why that's the case in association with all the wonderful genetic papers that have been put out by Dr. Russell and others on these conditions. And I wonder whether some of those things like the subtle differences or the hip abductor weakness is really gonna affect speed and is gonna affect balance, and if that's the case, how we might wanna be thinking about different interventions and therapies for different individuals across the lifespan. Um, so I'm gonna shift over now to some sort of, uh, to talk a little about treatment targets and more that are clinically based outside of physical and occupational therapy. I recognize that it is uh, 11.04, we have till 11.30. Just, and maybe I'm gonna be teasing Dr. Russell a little bit. Would you guys like me to move through some of this uh, and then we can leave some time for questions? Is that okay? Are we okay from a time period standpoint? Okay, maybe what I'll do is at least describe some of this depending on the slide because you guys have some of these slides and we have the updated recording also. Um, or updated slides I can send out, we'll skip over, just in an effort of time for you guys to, to have some questions or comments that you might have. So moving from that sort of, you know, we're now jumping from what the prevalence of motor differences in these conditions, how they can affect overall development, how we measure them and how we can improve measurement, and now thinking about actually what we can do about it. So maximizing motor and mobility over time. And I'm gonna focus on one area a little bit more and at the end offer some clinical tips for physical and occupational therapy. But the reason why I'm focusing on this is because some of my interest and research has led into this area, but also from a clinical perspective, I find that a lot of individuals that I work with with neurodevelopmental conditions and neurogenetic conditions often are not recommended some very typical physical activity and organized sports interventions that they should be and that can be really helpful for not only motor development but also social quality of life and physical health and well-being. So now we talk a little bit about how motor can affect language and cognition, but we also think about the fact that motor difficulties in individuals with developmental disabilities leads to greater sedentary behavior often. Right? So less engagement in physical activities that maybe other children or individuals would engage in, less activity maybe engagement with organized sports and physical activities. From a behavioral realm, so from a motor, physical health, less movement, from a behavioral, even fewer opportunities to engage with peers and other friends that maybe other children have an opportunity to do. And ultimately, I won't go through sort of the list of studies here, we see that that can have a negative impact on both behavior and health. So some of the data that I have here to the right is more in terms of health. This is from the CDC and from another paper. And we know that, so the recommended amount of physical activity in early childhood and through adolescence is 60 minutes daily of moderate to visit uh, vigorous physical activity. Now most kids without neurodevelopmental conditions, neurogenics and those are not meeting this. But the reality is, those with those conditions are even twice as likely to be inactive or ever meet this sort of uh, level of physical activity. So from that, we see up to 40% higher rates of obesity and greater co-occurring medical conditions like diabetes, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, and even fractures, for example, because of lower bone density. And so what do we know about organized activity? Well, in populations without neurodevelopmental conditions, or neur neur neurogenic conditions, we know that it's very good for the brain. It has long-term health benefits. It has mental health benefits in terms of lower rates of anxiety and depression. 
It has cognitive benefits, particularly in childhood studies, showing improvement in executive function and attention with engaging in sports. And it's very important in building social relationships. And in my own personal as well as clinical experience, not only for the child or adult, you know, the one with the genetic or developmental condition, but for the family and for the siblings. To be able to participate in that, to engage in that, and to share some of those interests as well. Here on the right just shows you, and you'll see some of the references that I use, uh, uh, excerpt just taking the fact that we've seen been, um, improvements in executive function or areas of the brain that control executive function with physical activity. So we also know that there's benefits of organized physical activity in those with neurodevelopmental conditions. So, and we know that there's improvements both in motor and non-motor areas as I described. And these are described in these two studies. And I'll move through these a little bit quickly for time, but these are also dividing a few different studies and showing what some of the benefits were with those with neurogenetic and neurodevelopmental conditions. So the first one was a very intensive program, 48 weeks long with children with autism. And ultimately what they did were strength exercises, coordination. So we're talking intensive, likely a dose response when we see some of the benefits. Um, but they showed improved lipid profiles, cholesterol profiles, perceived quality of life, and repetitive and stereotype behaviors. In the second one, not as intensive, but also remote, something to be considering in the era that we're in. These were in adults with Down syndrome. They did 12 weeks of a remote exercise intervention, and they found that those who did it two times per week had a significant improvement in memory, uh, but a non-significant, but improvement in intention and reaction time. And in the last one, again, we see individuals with autism, it was a 10 week swimming intervention versus a control, and they saw an improvement in social awareness and competence and reduced irritability. So some improvements across the board, a uh, few different studies there, not many that have been done as rigorously as we'd like, we have a need for that, but at least showing some of those benefits. This, I'll just mention to you the name, it's a program that I work with, um, it's called Acing Autism. They do serve other neurodevelopmental conditions as well, but it's an adaptive sports program. Um, and really what it is to highlight is uh, we've done some standardized questionnaires. We were about to launch a study and then it was uh, March 2020, as you all know. So we quickly went back and we did a survey. Surveys are not, it's important to know it's rigorous as some of our standardized more uh, um, uh, studies that we do or randomized control studies, but at least gave us a sense of the fact. What we did was we surveyed program directors of this program across the nation, because it's in 80 sites across the nation. And we gave them a Likert scale to see whether or not they saw benefits in these areas. And we allowed them to say that they saw a significant decline, a decline, no improvement, or some improvement. And what we saw essentially, when you see here on the left, the side over here, were the different domains that we asked down at the bottom were percentages. And as you can see, we saw improvements in multiple different areas. But notably, in terms of on-task engagement or sort of attention during the program, social skills, uh, they were happy to see that tennis skills were also improved. That makes the tennis uh, players feel a lot better. And, but also in other motor skills. And that improvement in other motor skills are important for building other fundamental motor skills that we talked about earlier. Uh, we did start another program here at UCLA called the Expressive Movement Initiative. We are doing a study around it. Uh, just in terms of time, I won't go into as much detail. What I'll say is that we serve a range of individuals. Um, regardless of the research study, it's also offered outside of that. So know whether, you know, I'm showing it here just because we've been able to serve a lot more individuals uh, in other states, actually, since we've gone remote. Um, so uh, it was founded here at UCLA in 2019. The founder of the program is actually now a resident at Stanford in pediatrics. Her name is Dr. Emily Coker. She's phenomenal. She came to me when she was a medical student because she was interested in child neurology and in motor and in dance. And we started a program here at UCLA. And since then, really, I can take very little credit because it's taken off by the undergraduates here. It's a volunteer-led program. Individuals are paired one-to-one. -one. Um, the people entering the program with a buddy, which they, right now, we're doing all remote sessions, hopefully in person again, through Zoom, uh, leading through different movement of the body, expressive movement of the body. Um, and it's important to know, and I see maybe I took out that slide and I'm happy to add that back in or send it to Amanda, but there are other programs like that out there, particularly during the pandemic. There are programs offered through the Special Olympics as well. If you go to their website, I have some links here to Google that. And there's also links that the Special Olympics provides to just do some more motor activity at home too, which can be helpful. So that's kind of as we summarize, it's sort of maximizing movement abilities and some of my clinical kind of tips to families, but also providers, 
and to families to bring to their providers. One, routine screening for these motor impairments is very important. And that might seem a little bit common sense, but the reality is, is if they're not very prominent, they often don't get routinely screened. And the reality is, is maybe some of them looked prominent to me yesterday, but they're not gonna look prominent to other people. They're gonna be very subtle. And I see some head nods, I'm glad to hear some parents feel. And I saw those subtleties. And the reality is, is maybe the need after a certain point is not intensive OT or intensive physical therapy, but it's making sure that those children aren't getting pulled out of those programs or out of PE or adaptive PE to be doing other things. That that's still very important at, to a degree along with other therapies. Or what I find often in my clinic is those subtle motor impairments because here at least in California, when you can safely access the school and the playground, school, your IEP will no longer get physical therapy. But the reality is you could still be very wide based, you could still have very poor balance, and it may not necessarily be given through school, but it should be something I think at least consider to talk to your provider about so whether or not that should be continued outside of the schools. Or if we're really sort of beyond that one-on-one -on -one therapy, thinking about some of these organized programs in the hundred other things all of you are doing, if time permits, because some of those opportunities lend building higher level motor ability, but also offer that sort of social engagement with other peers and an ability to see what other peers are doing. I already touched on physical and occupational therapy throughout adolescence and adulthood. I often see that drop out, or there might be a period of time that's not needed. Or at least in my observations yesterday, we do see continued spasticity. I won't preclude any other syndromes, but what I particularly saw in boring opens yesterday, I do have one patient in my clinic with that, and it's important if that spasticity is worsening, we go back and thinking about doing some physical therapy sessions or at least some range of motion exercises and getting some education around that to be able to do that at home and maximize that mobility as much as possible. These referrals to programs that are adapted for children and adults, talking to your provider about that, thinking about your um, maybe coordinator, what we call here in uh, California regional centers, but otherwise early childhood providers. As a clinician, I try to recommend to families activities that might reduce sedentary behavior as a whole. So the reality is there's a lot going on. There are a lot of things, at least families, all of you have to do. But even if it's five minutes outside before dinner or after dinner, it's a walk to the end of the block and walk back. It's just that period of time that keeps the whole family active and is a little extra movement for the individual. And then the other thing that I try to do for my patients here and maybe then uh, families can take to their providers is I help create a medical profile if they're gonna enter an adaptive program of some sort of any that talks a little bit about seizure or epilepsy if that's the case, what to do. It's a little different than the emergency medicine that you guys, many of you might have had to fill out for the school, but it's like, this is what you look for, this is how you do it, this is okay when it presents this way. Also information on language, what's the best way to communicate, what's not the best way to communicate, behavior. My child likes to be touched, they don't like to be touched, you have to prompt them in this way, this is how you don't prompt them. Using a visual schedule is better, so I can work with you, coach or teacher, to create that based off of that. And some of those techniques that I found are in coaches who really don't feel as comfortable in these, but really want to serve these populations helps them do that and helps them integrate um, a lot of individuals with developmental disabilities into their programs. So with that, I'll just summarize, uh, and I apologize for moving a little quickly at the end. I realize it's 12, uh, what this is, 11, 15. <laughs> but we saw today that motor impairments can serve as a risk, a marker of concern, or a marker for greater developmental difficulties, that they're quite prevalent, that activities that maximize movement and mobility should be considered across a lifespan and in varying forms both therapeutic, PT and OT, and recreational, and that organized physical activity can have both motor and non-motor benefits. Uh, I'm here at CART to have these slides with this information, and I wanna thank uh, particularly all of you for your time. I wanna sincerely thank you again for your time in participating in the study and talking to me yesterday. I really enjoyed meeting all of you and meeting all of your children. Um, and then I wanna thank, of course, my collaborators here and the Motor Lab, many of them who are here and you met, Jeff, Chris, Horace, Serene, sitting here in the audience that we're very excited to meet all of you as well. So thank you very much for your time. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. This one. Do you have any questions? Or chat. Whichever. Or thoughts. Leave it or thoughts or comments.
so the same for the TV show. Oh, thank you. For the TV show, how do um, patients find out about the research that's done with the ones you've upcoming? I know I've been involved with other researchers, but do you typically reach out to parents who have children with the ASS? Yeah. Very good question. Well, now we will a lot more, especially because I've been here and Dr. Well and Dr. Russell probably does quite a bit. Typically, how our research studies go is we either do social media blasts, right? Instagram, Facebook, um, emails. What we're finding more and more is just to kind of touch on this is the people. Oh, sorry, no, it's okay. Um, is the people who are getting these are the people who signed up once, or we're lucky enough to find one study or come into the clinic. So other ways that we're trying to do is we send to a lot of providers in the community, like primary care providers, to let um, them know. What I would suggest, I can speak to UCLA, but even others, is you know honestly just Googling the center and Googling plus study or the condition, because sometimes that comes across. Um, but mainly it's social media, it's sending it to primary care providers, and then more and more as the pandemic is getting better, which we were doing previously, is going to do community lectures and talks. So one thing you might find on Facebook pages of some of these organizations are community lectures or community talks, or uh, you know what we call we call them uh, coffee carts, where we have 30 minutes and it's kind of more just less scientific and more like here are some tidbits to take, um, and oftentimes those posts come up on Facebook too. Yeah. And the Art Foundation's website tries to keep up on stuff like that too. Yeah, so that would probably be a very good place to go. So and as Julie said, the for the mic, the Art Foundation has those resources too. Can you talk a little bit about robotics and how you feel about, you know, like uh, <laughs> the ASO and ASO um, and personalization of yeah, no. So the question was if I can speak a little bit more about how I feel about AFOs and stabilization of gait. So I think, uh, I guess to answer it in two ways, and I am, in all honesty, I'm not an AFO expert in the sense, and I think I even spoke a little bit to a family yesterday where um, I recognize when they're needed, and I'll kind of answer your question. So I think they're important, particularly in certain areas where we see a lot of overpronation, right? A lot of ankle or joint instability just because if we're seeing that and that's the case and there's not some stability there, it can lend to more injury. Um, but when I say in the expertise in terms of type, what I highly recommend, and this is actually part of I should mention at the end, is I do defer to our CP clinic and the orthotist there in particular. Oftentimes a lot of physical therapists are very knowledgeable about it, but the orthotist can be helpful within cerebral palsy clinics or other orthopedic clinics. And one thing that I do find to kind of speak to that is I do think they're important, but what I also think is the importance is that they're monitored over time and we make sure that they've been updated. Because one of the things that I do find is that it falls off just because, you know, the orthopedist or someone, this is not everyone, says that the AFOs don't fall off, but meaning that falls off the thing to do, say, well, you need to see us once a year or just as needed, right? And then you have a physical therapist maybe recommending this or trying to make sure and we find that kids or individuals or adults outgrow those orthotics or might need a different, you know, higher or lower. And so having that check-in more routinely, if you're seeing that's the case every six months or every year, is important. But I do think they're important in certain cases. I have seen some individuals who have them on that maybe it wasn't as needed, which is why, again, I referred them to the orthotist just to make sure. But overall, I do think they, they can have a lot of benefit. In specifics, I can't speak too much to them. Yeah. But thank you for the question. Any comments? Oh, go ahead. Yes. I just have one question. So you just mentioned that organized physical activity is a benefit for just all functional skills. It's just not gross motor, but intellectual skills helps go around, which I agree with. Uh, you had mentioned a couple uh, of OTAs that you mentioned with like tennis and dance, I believe. Yeah. Um, for, for children with intellectual and physical disabilities, right, that those two activities don't necessarily Uh, yeah. Necessary to my child. Yeah. What are OPAs that are necessary to that, not extreme, but that advanced yeah. opinion yeah. for children who can't do that? Yeah. So I'll answer that way. Very, very good question. And recognizing fully in what I presented is not uh, representative of what everyone can engage in. I will tell you this, and this is respectfully as we discuss and for you to even check out the dance sort of program, not the one here at UCLA, but what I'll say is some of the dance and movement do require right uh, being able to recognize the movement being able to mimic it being able to remember it 
what I'll say is there are a lot of, there aren't a lot, but there are some programs out there where it would be important because I actually do consider dance, or what I should say more is expressive movement of the body, to be one that I've recommended to some of my patients who have both intellectual and physical difficulties. Because my goal, and usually the program's goal if they're adapted appropriately, is not the expectation that you memorize a movement or that you follow this choreography. It's that you're in a setting that's gonna ask you to move your body in some way, is gonna put you around other people who are moving in that way, so whatever you're taking from them, you're just moving your body rather than being more sedentary. So that's just kind of, in that regard, it's very program dependent. It's very much who feels comfortable with it. But the idea is, is you're going to a program where you're gonna move in some way. Now to answer otherwise, other things that I have found beyond that are programs like, uh, and these are, they may not traditionally be considered OPA, but horseback riding, for example, or what they call hippotherapy, shown to also have evidence to improve core functions too. Um, and this may not be for everyone also, but swimming. And in some sort of swimming where the expectation is not, you're doing laps back and forth, but you're somehow keeping your body anti-gravity within the water, you're moving your legs, you're moving your body, which can help tone and can also help movement. So those are two particular ones. The other ones, it really takes something for the program, like the dance one, but I even speak to the tennis a little bit, is that the expectation is not, and this may not always be the case, and this also requires a range of function. And the coach doesn't have the expectation that you're gonna be on the court, you're gonna hold the tennis rack and you're gonna hit the ball. It's that you're gonna be on the court, you might run around the court a few times, you're gonna see some peers who are doing the same thing, you might take the ball and you might throw the ball. But to answer your question, which I understand is, probably more the horseback riding and the swimming that I see across intellectual and physical abilities. If I can put in a pitch for Please. one of the afternoon sessions today, there's a specialized therapy uh, session that, that some of the family members who have done those type of uh, therapies will be talking about. So I think that might be useful. useful I'd also like to add on that um, Tony Ray, what's the Tony Williams class? And it's okay to say that, you know, my class is on ambulatory. We just want to come roll around on the mat. And usually, you, you know, they'll welcome you with open arms. That's, a, yeah, so two of the things were, one uh, gentleman mentioned that there this afternoon, there'll be some talks on it, and I agree completely, which is some of the tumbling, and I, I don't, not necessarily a name, but it's, you know, my gym is one of those things, but it does often require, not require, I should never use the word require. A lot of the activities are climbing, but it's exactly that, it's sort of my expectation coming in is not that they, because oftentimes what the coaches tell me is, I'm worried that's expectation, I'm not gonna meet it, and if I don't meet it, the family's gonna be like, why am I here? Versus when they hear from a family oftentimes, this is what we say, where it's like, this is not my expectation. I just want them to move around a little bit and have that same opportunity to explore a safe space where they can move around. But yes, that's what I found at least anecdotally. I just found that we have two different things. Everyone's crazy. They have a different opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So AYSO Everyone Place is one, and then a little we do so as well in the California area. And I think that's a, my hope with this talk and others is to bring more talk about this, because oftentimes this is what it takes. A family meeting, a couple of parents giving some suggestions, and the reality is it should be more widely dispersed, this information and the benefits of that, but that's helpful. Thank you very much. Any other comments on my reflections yesterday? It's okay if not. You agree, you disagree. You wanna add something to the motor reflections that I had. These are early, just so you know. I have a lot more thinking to do, but. I actually have a question. Um, on the gate, the one that was short on the one side and longer on the other, yeah. you talked about maybe looking for brain reasons. Have they sometimes then used that to find like a strange bone anomaly that maybe they missed before, or like maybe just something a little twisted and it's painful for them to walk, so they've adapted their gait, or yeah, has that been the case too, or has it mostly been brain in this case? No, for me, clinically, that's been the case. From a gait perspective, most of the time, the individuals have come in from the research study. We've known prior to that, that time that there might be some limb difference, um, but from a clinical perspective, when I've seen them walk, I, we have noticed something that hasn't been explored before, where we actually saw maybe long bone, bone abnormalities that I then made a recommendation to an orthopedist and also gave some information for the genetic testing that we were trying to get as well. Yeah, and as you all, well, maybe not all, but some of you have come across to get uh, genetic testing authorized, you have to give them lots of evidence 
And this clinical evidence is very beneficial to say, these are not just developmental delays that we've seen. These are also these bone structural abnormalities, these gait abnormalities, these in an effort to not only target it a little bit more, but also get that authorization. So clinically, yes, I've seen that. Well, again, I appreciate all of your time. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Uh, you know, as I said even before, these recommendations and comments weren't comprehensive, but at least hopefully a start to start thinking about. I think all of you know that motor function is important, but just in the fact that different ways in which we can maybe target it, but different ways in thinking about it across um, as kids and adults and adolescents get older as well. But again, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your participation in the study. I appreciate getting to know all of you and your children or those who you care for a little bit better. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me as well. Um, this slide usually has my email, but I know Amanda has it. So I'm very happy to, to connect with anybody. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.